to introduce both of the speakers uh, who will now begin uh, downstairs. Uh, downstairs, uh, we have in Hall B, Wendy Zhang, presenting "Growing into Universal," Con uh, sorry, "Growing into Universal Consciousness," and that will be beginning momentarily, as well as Sam Alchemist presenting up here, Eros, Phobos, and the Roots of Morality. So, please welcome Sam and Wendy. So, the clash of instinct and culture. Is there a clash? <laughs> the title of my talk itself presupposes that there is a clash. And that there is a, this clash that we know in our bodies. Because somewhere along the way, we became civilized. We tamed our animal natures. And as exemplified by this audience silently sitting in rows before me. <laughs> done a very good job at it. <laughs> so, um, these unruly desires have been subdued, and around five years of age, we've developed what developmental psychologists call the moral self. We distinguish right from wrong, good from bad. Yet we can ask how such a clash is possible if culture has organically emerged in the process of evolution. Can't we then say that the taming of our so-called instincts is in fact instinctual? Is not human nature essentially of nature with a capital N? And thus, culture is a manifestation of that nature. <laughs> As will become apparent in this talk, my answer is yes and no. Yes to the fact that culture is a naturally emergent phenomenon, a product of human nature. No to the degree in which it is antagonistic to the essential core of human nature, the self-actualization of life potential. And this is what has inspired me to give this talk today. It's part of my dissertation research, and it, this is a little piece, a glimpse of some of the work that I'm working on. And part of my um, process here is based on a conviction that I hold. This conviction, um, which is guided by my life experience, is one, that human beings have an essential nature that thrives in the creative manifestation of its potential potential, and two, that our culture has, in general, ceased its organic development, and has instead rigidified into a fixed system of control that fails to foster this deep and essential life potential. But the ironic piece here is that human existence is, to some extent, a struggle. It is a long and often hard road that we walk in order to uncover and embody the creative essence of our natures. For, for whatever reason, in this world, human nature can also be distorted. In fact, this is a fact which is unique to the human species and is exemplified by a much too long history of war, violence, and abuse. This is yet another unique feature of the human species, killing our own kind, and even to an extreme degree. This irony, this blunt twist of fate, leads to the natural emergence of a culture, a culture of law, order, and justice. Thus, the crucial question here is, how can we foster a culture that can stand strongly in the face of truly heartbreaking violence and oppression, and still be flexible enough to foster the organic development of life potential? that essential seed of our natures. This question is the thesis of this talk, 
And I do not pretend to have an all-encompassing answer, but only hope to provoke insights into a few specific possible origins of this fundamental question. To do so, I will first turn to Freud's depth psychology of the instincts. I will then place Freud's psychological theory in an evolutionary perspective by examining the recent work of a philosopher, Maxine Sheets Johnstone, who I'm in love with <laughs> also, and in specific, her biologically situated investigation of the ontogenetic roots of morality, ontogenesis, the birth of being, the way in which any organism develops. So, Freud is here. So for Freud, the instincts constituted the elemental driving forces of human nature. Forces that were often, in some cases, always in direct conflict with the needs of our conscious awareness. Psychological illness, according to Freud, was caused by a conflict between these needs that arose as a result of an excessive damming up of improperly discharged instinctual energy. So as this instinctual energy builds up and is not properly related, integrated in the life, psychological illness, psychosis results. In Freud's view, the discharging of instinctual energy was a necessary process for psychic health, for he viewed the instincts as vital forces continually striving to bring about the satisfaction of their needs. He postulated two instincts that he felt to be at the basic core of neurosis. Conflict, uh-huh. <coughs> so, the first was the sexual instinct, which involved, in a basic sense, the desire for sexual gratification. This desire included pleasure in its most elementary sense, yet the sexual instinct also had a much broader di dimension that involved the desire for harmony and union on the grandest scale, the instinct of life, as Freud later called it. In this broader sense, Freud viewed the sexual instinct as the driving force of culture. Albeit in a supplemented and interjected form, sexuality impelled the further and further creative unity of humanity. The second, the aggressive instinct, on the other hand, is the polar opposition of this sexual instinct. Being inherently aggressive, regressive in nature, According to Freud, it strove to restore an earlier state of things, a returning to the source, a state that existed before we were alive, and in other words, death. In essence, its aim was the complete destruction of the human species, the dissolution of all unions, which Freud later called the death instinct. From this polarization between a desire for death, the death instinct, and the desire for creative union and pleasure, the sexual instinct, Freud had presented a fundamental conflict at the heart of human nature. As he puts it in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, <coughs> the evolution of civilization is no longer obscure to us. It must present the struggle between eros and death between the instinct of life and the instinct of destruction as it works itself out in the human species. <laughs> <laughs> so the clash of instinct and culture in Freud's writings is grand indeed. A greater clash is hardly imaginable. It is fantastic and morbid in some sense as it may be. It has been close enough to the state of human affairs to inspire and provoke an immense response commentators attempting to grapple with the moral foundation of human instinctual nature. And so it is to the validity, in some sense, the roots of his claim that we now turn by opening to the evolutionary ethics of Maxine Sheets Johnstone and her investigation into the roots of morality. So, in her recent book, The Roots of Morality, Sheets Johnstone uses her unique interdisciplinary approach to examine the onto and phylogenetic roots of a broad range of philosophical claims about human morality to, in her words, investigate the fundamental moral tension underlying human social behavior. 
Now I will use her work to examine the developmental ground of that behavior and attempt to reveal those instincts that dwell at the core of human morality. So, to begin, we can follow Sheets Johnstone as she turns to the first natural signs of moral import in human development. It is nothing, um, yeah. So, where do we look for the first signs? Beginning with the good aspect, she looks to Spitz's um, well-known study on what's known as the smiling response in developmental psychology. Spitz found that the first social interaction of the infant occurs at around three to four months of age. It involves a beaming smile on the part of an infant in response to a face and a movement of that face. The smile is a spontaneous initiatory act on behalf of the infant. Not a response to a smile, simply a response to a presence. For the face before them can present any expression and Spitz played around with using different masks, fanged masks or bare, you know, faces, different faces. And you put this, any kind of face with movement in front of the child and will receive this. <laughs> oh, hello. <laughs> I'm here. So, thus, in three months, we have the first culturally <coughs> unadulterated pan-human expression across all of the human species. Um, of pleasure and joy, an instinct of love. It is an affectionate reaching out on behalf of the child. The smile connects us and draws out nurturance and support. It is part of our instinctual repertoire, an ontogenetically situated reflection of our benevolent natures. And so, in some sense, we've uncovered this benevolent side of our human self. This sense that is there right from the beginning. But what of the darker half? It's a bit more complex looking at that. Um, what of this destructive half? <laughs> so in order to fully see it, we can look at two developmental markers. Um, originally I had four, but I took out two so we could simplify things. The first is known as the Moro reflex. It occurs as a result of a sudden loud noise or loss of support, after which the infant throws back their arms and arches their back. It is essentially an inchoate fear response that is present from birth to three months, wherein it gradually disappears and the second developmental marker occurs. This is an image, actually, a, an image from a medical manual. Um, so when you get, do give birth, one of the tests to make sure the baby is healthy is they drop it or bang a noise so that this response will be evoked. Because if it's not evoked, there can be severe sensory motor development. That's a whole other issue here. <laughs> so the second developmental marker is called the startle response, which is brought about by the same stimulus as the moral <laughs> reflex. A sudden loud noise or a loss of support. Yet unlike the extended bodily kinetic of the moral response, um, the startle response involves a complete flexion or protective movement of the body. Here it is important to note that both reflexes are involuntary responses to environmental stimuli. Unlike the initiatory social expression of the smile, they are reactive responses to a threatening and unexpected world. In other words, they reflect a biologically rooted fear of the unfamiliar in an elemental and somatic way. Whereas the moral reflex is a kind of surrender to the unknown, an exposure of vulnerability, the Star Wars response involves a defensive or contracted stance against it. And unlike the moral reflex, the Star Wars response never disappears from the somatic repertoire. It remains a natural form of defense against the unexpected, a foundational reality of the pan-animate emotion of fear that is seen within vertebrate and invertebrate species alike. It speaks essentially to the reality of the vulnerability of animate life and to the instinct of fear that emerges to 
preserve that life. Thus, with the moral reflex and the startle response, we have a basic sense of the ontogeny of fear as it naturally emerges in human development. A fear that is essentially of the unfamiliar and unknown, and at its core, a fear of the greatest unknown, a fear of death. Yet what does instinctual fear have to do with destruction and with the darker side of human nature? And what does it have to do with the clash of instinct and culture? To answer this question, we have to examine the inverse relationship that exists between fear and anger. <laughs> to quote Sheets Johnstone, quote, it is a psychological truism that underneath anger is fear or hurt or both. That is, rather than feeling fear or hurt, one feels anger towards the feared person, the one who inflicts or has the potential to inflict harm. We have the wisdom of Yoda here. Fear is the path of the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Anger then emerges as a response to fear, as a defensive response stimulated to protect one's identity, be it physical, psychological, or ideological. In addition, uh, fear and anger are incompatible kinetic feelings. So to say fear propels us from and anger propels us towards, they cannot exist simultaneously. Anger is driven by fear, and fear hides beneath it. And each is essentially an involuntary response in relation to the elemental vulnerability of our natures. Here we return then to the thesis that was addressed at the beginning. For if we are to face with the reality of a culture, our culture, and from this analysis, it is not difficult to see how such a culture, or an individual for that matter, that does not recognize the inherent vulnerability of animate life, could easily cultivate an excess of violence, or even war, as an instinctual response to protect and defend oneself from the somatically rooted fear of the unknown. Culture, in this case, would serve as a means to control this basic instinctual fear, and by not recognizing this core fear, unconsciously promote aggression in order to keep us guarded from the terrific fear that lies beneath. This new awareness calls us to reconsider Freud's psychology of the instincts. Freud's instinct of life, eros, the drive towards unity and enjoyment of pleasure, does, in a fundamental way, reflect this affect of an infant's smile, this yearning towards relationship, the sense of potential union that awaits. Um, such a smile reveals a somatically primal root of morality itself, a natural human tendency towards intimate relations. Eros then has, albeit in a more nuanced and complex light than Freud presents it, a developmental ground in human ontogeny. The instinct of death Thanatos, on the other hand, seems to be, rather than any kind of instinctual propensity, <coughs> a distortion of the developmentally emergent fear of the unknown. Freud's destructive instinct, the desire of humans to kill themselves and others, does not have phylogenetic roots. Although uh, this relationship exists between Phobos and Thanatos, fear and death. And when you're moved, when you're the fear is hidden beneath, in Freud's vision, death becomes the main thing. Death, desire to kill, this anger that's being projected and put outward. So, if we were looking for sources for the evolution of human civilization, sources that are at the heart of the conflict between instinct and culture, and that are ontogenetically rooted across the human species, it seems that Eros and Phobos would be better suited descriptors than Eros and Thanatos. Not as metaphysical possibilities, but as existential realities of real life human experience. Eros and Phobos. <laughs>
Um, I don't recommend looking for fear pictures on the internet. They'd be pretty sick to me, so this is the, the nicest one that I can show you. Um, just to get a sense of those energies that are there. So what then of the clash between instinct and culture? The empirical evidence here suggests that a key to ending this clash involves recognizing the simple reality of Eros and Phobos as essential features of our evolutionary heritage. Perhaps the most essential involves recognizing that fear is not an unnatural or abnormal response, but a natural affect of animate life of what it means to be alive. Yet as long as we continue to, not, to deny it, and with it to deny the fact of our elemental vulnerability, mm -hmm. we will continue to be unconsciously ruled by it. Our legacy of violence will also continue, and cu culture will necessarily continue to stand in opposition to the expression of a distorted instinctual nature. The crucial question then is how can we develop an awareness of who we are as human beings, an awareness of our natures, so that we can act from within that knowledge and end our instinctual unconsciousness. As Sheets Johnstone puts it, quote, if one is unconscious in the sense of being asleep to one's motivations and the moral character of one's actions, one remains outside the bounds of morality altogether. In other words, we remain blind to the possibility of manifesting a different human history. It is my hope that through educating ourselves as to the nature of human natures, of our human natures, we may one day obtain a new awareness such that the clash of instinct and culture will cease to be a clash and instead exist as a harmonious blending of human nature and the nature, the life of nature itself. <laughs> Ta -da. Anna. Um, in instances of um, self-harm and anger toward against oneself. What kind of fear leads to such behavior? Can you repeat the question? In instances of self-harm and anger towards oneself, um, what kind of fear leads to that kind of behavior? Um, well, remember I said beneath anger is fear or hurt. So there's an interesting um, relationship between fear and hurt in the sense of hurt, kind of escalating fear, and that pain um, that's there, that's connected kind of to, this, to our this basic sense of what it means to be alive. For me, the core here that I didn't go into also is this sense of, as an organism, as a human being that's growing and developing, when you're receiving love and affection and support, you're receiving a somatic message to some extent that your life is desired. Mm -hmm. I want you to live. I want you to continue living. Mm -hmm. And you're, when you're receiving somatic messages um, of abuse, um, you know, hurtful experiences or pain, um, somatically your organism is receiving messages, I don't want you to live. I don't want you to live. So the organism then has to deal with these two uh, fundamental kinds of experiences. And so, yeah, I mean, it depends on each situation. And I don't know if you want to say more about the specific situation you're talking about, but, but it's contextual, complex. It's very simple to present, you know, two things and have it all nice and cool. Yeah. Briefly talk about the two responses you left out. Stay yeah, with those are. Sure. One of them is uh, the phenomenon of stranger anxiety, mm -hmm. in which 
reaches its peak, you know, like around two years, four years, and then slowly goes away. But what does it mean that there's this elemental fear of unknown human beings that we carry as a human species? You know, that's, that's not, it varies at different degrees depending on the child. It's not something like the, these reflexes that are throughout. But um, stranger anxiety is a big one. Where does that go? And what is that sense of that unknown when you're walking down the street and someone's walking behind you or when you have this fear, you know, and how does that also, a lack of awareness of this basic, this basic fear that we carry um, play into our cultural and political spheres, you know, inside, outside, in-group, out-group, those countries, you know, these kinds of things. And the other one? And the other one, yeah, the other one is just different things, like I was saying to Anna, in terms of developmental conditions. So it's a basic kind of developmental theory of how, yeah, how our essential natures can be nurtured or not. And so if you're in an environment, you're going to have these essential reactions that we all have. Fear is a natural part. You know, eros is a natural part. Um, but depending on the developmental conditions, um, so it's not, not a developmental marker in the same sense, although it is kind of like the house within which development emerges, which is a huge factor. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Sam, I'm interested in knowing how this particular glimpse into your research informs you and influences you in your everyday life. Can you give examples? Um, yeah, well, I mean, an awareness of these kind of fundamental um, aspects of human nature, you know, has really given me a sense of, I mean, it's, it's a long process still in progress of cultivating this awareness, you know. But say, for instance, someone is really angry at you, you know, or you're in a situation where you're witnessing anger being... Um, you know, like someone reacting from a wounded place and, you know, saying we have to go kill everyone and we're going to do this or that. How then can you listen um, and even invite a space for essentially the vulnerability that, you know, it's a reaction from that vulnerability saying that I am a fragile, finite being who's facing this, you know. And so for me it's, it's a process of developing a deep empathy, a deep sense of, yeah, relationship. So there's many instances or examples I can feel around that, but just in general, you know, and also working with groups and with Marina, and just kind of really trying to hold a sense of always continuing my question, my thesis and my dissertation <laughs> is just like, what is human nature? Who are we as human beings and what does it mean? Because for me, through a knowledge of that, of that understanding, um, it's really essential to be able to help cultivate a new world. So that's good. I just feel like a uh, big thing when it comes to fear or is, is what happens in, in, a, in a chaotic moment, um, especially a violent chaotic moment that you don't have any control over. Uh, maybe some of the interactions are you know, I don't want to put out any vibes or anything, but, you know, some, something happens right in our midst, we're just doing our thing, uh, and automatically we're going to respond with this, most of us are going to be fearful, what's happening, people that know CPR are going to be like, how can I help, you know, there's different ways of responding in that chaos, and, uh, how do you think that we can change, especially in an instance where we, we tend to fight violence with violence, how do we, what's our other options, I guess I'm trying to does this inform any other options? You know, if somebody attacks you, how can you respond that doesn't perpetuate the violence? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a big question. But um, how, you know, how simply an awareness, a deeper awareness of human nature allows you to, you know, save your life or engage in the ways necessary, but not getting lost in a reactive state. 
I guess right when you said that, I thought, well, most of, a lot of people will respond in an unconscious way, as you explained, this sort of embedded, maybe even taught by culture how to respond, but we don't even realize why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. And then we are just kind of maybe think, well, if you're, if you're consciously responding, I mean, you have some intention behind your actions, then that would probably be the only way to, because then you know what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, it's a process of, you know, another talk would be how to embody this wisdom, you know, how to bring it into the rhythms of your, your organic, you know, identity, so that you do have a deep sense, you know, of it. It's not sim simply a conceptual, you be fear down there or something, you know, and it's a process of being able to you know, deeply go into your own fear, you know. In our culture where, you know, in general, fear is you know, pushed, push through your fear, move through it, you know. It's not, not okay to be fear. Fear is not nurtured as a natural part of what it means to be a human being. Um, you know, in our kinds of communities, so often when fear does come, it's like, you know, I want to get rid of it. I shouldn't be afraid, you know, or that's, you know, weak, weakness, you know, fear. And, uh, you know, and so much of that culture perpetuates that to the point where we can't acknowledge, we get so split from the reality of our fear, the reality that we're just vulnerable, tender human beings trying to live, that we forget. And so in that forgetting, um, you know, we get lost, we get more and more lost. And it's really sad to see you know, the majority of our culture, especially men, you know, that I've worked a lot with, and things, holding this, you know, this real denial of their nature. Mm -hmm. so, Time's up.